Hello, my name is Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. It is my pleasure to guide you through Soviet Russia as we continue our journey. Before we journey through this period, allow me to help you understand the emerging Russian culture by reflecting on this period of great experiment and search for new forms and ideas. In every area of art, painting, sculpture, architecture, literature, music, theater, and ballet, Russia was on the forefront, bringing to the world dramatically new concepts of beauty. For example, pioneers of modern art were Russian artists Vasily Kandinsky, Mikhail Rubel, Marc Chagall, and Kazimir Malevich. The period before the Russian Revolution was also a time of extraordinary diversity of ideas, ranging from the most conservative to the most radical and revolutionary. The press, which had enjoyed an uninterrupted growth since the time of Alexander II, was never freer. By 1916, there were 14,000 newspapers and magazines in Russia, 6,000 in Moscow and St. Petersburg alone which reflected every shade of political, philosophical, and artistic opinion. One of the most popular philosophies became the one of Marxism. I was drawn to Marxism. What was the concept of Marxism? Marxism was based on the philosophy of Karl Marx, a German who believed that in an ideal society there would be no private property all property would be shared and equally distributed. Wealthy landholders would give up their land so it could be divided among the peasants. Then the dictatorship of the proletariat, the poor working class, would create a classless society where no one went hungry and no one lived in luxury off the toil of others. Marx thought the working class would lead the way to change but because the working class was so small in Russia, I added a new feature to Marxism. I believed that a small disciplined party would represent the interest of the workers. Such a party was formed in Russia and I took command of it. It was called the Party of Bolsheviks, later known as the Communist Party. What two governments were trying to run Russia at the same time? At the time of chaos, after the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II, two power blocks emerged. One was the provisional government led by Alexander Kerensky. The other was called the Soviet or Council of Workers and Soldiers Deputies. The Bolsheviks were the majority in the Petrograd and Moscow councils. Comrade Trotsky, president of the Petrograd Soviet, and I planned and executed a coup. On November 7, 1917, the Bolsheviks stormed the Winter Palace, headquarters of the provisional government. The Bolsheviks overthrew Kerensky's government at gunpoint and took power. How did the Bolsheviks manage to take over? The provisional government might have been successful under ordinary conditions, but the situation in Russia was very difficult. The provisional government had to deal with the country at war, food shortages, an empty treasury, and a frustrated people who demanded change. We Bolsheviks demanded an immediate peace with Germany. But Alexander Kerensky, the provisional government's leader, was pressured by Britain and the United States to keep fighting. Kerensky launched a new attack against Germany. However, after his forces were badly beaten, riots and demonstrations broke out in Petrograd. We used this situation to our advantage. What were the first steps of the Bolsheviks? After the provisional government was overthrown, I announced the birth of a new Russian Soviet Republic. Later that same year, the Russian capital was moved from Petrograd to Moscow, B. 
because of Moscow's more central location. A red flag began to wave over the Kremlin. Private property was abolished. All land, industry and natural wealth became property of the state. This policy was supported by the workers and peasants. Nevertheless, there still were serious problems in Russia. Who opposed communism in Russia? Many people in Russia were opposed to communism. The result was civil war. The Russian civil war was an additional ordeal for a country already seriously affected by World War I and a revolution. The sides were divided into the whites and the reds. The reds consisted of Bolsheviks and the government whose army was under the leadership of comrade Trotsky. The whites were led largely by members of the old aristocracy who were united to overthrow me and the Bolshevik government. But they did not succeed in their two-year struggle. Our Bolshevik government then moved to crush all possible opposition. Tsar Nicholas II and his family were seized and executed on July 16, 1918 at Yekaterinburg in the foothills of the Ural Mountains. We found this necessary because we Bolsheviks feared the imprisoned imperial family would fall into the hands of the whites and be used to rally opposition to our regime. You might know this event through the story of Anastasia, the youngest daughter of the Tsar. Many people believe she survived the massacre, but I don't think so. By 1922, the Bolsheviks had become the Communist Party and Russia had become the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. I am the founder of the Soviet Union. The name of the city of Petrograd was changed to Leningrad in my honor. I died in January of 1924. After my death, a power struggle developed between comrade Leon Trotsky and comrade Joseph Stalin. Trotsky was the Communist Party's leading thinker, while Stalin was its chief administrator. Since Stalin was the general secretary of the Communist Party, he was able to provide jobs for many people. This helped him in his struggle with Trotsky. Stalin forced Trotsky to resign as war minister. Later, he expelled him from the party and sent him into exile. Eventually, Trotsky went to Mexico and was murdered in 1940. What were the goals of Stalin's first plan? By 1929, Stalin was dictator of the Soviet Union. Realizing that the Soviet Union was decades behind the Western nations in manufacturing, production and national defense, he pushed to modernize and industrialize the Soviet Union. He proposed the first of his famous five-year plans, to guide the Soviet Union to economic health in the fastest possible time. Part of the plan was to improve industrial production by putting out three times the amount of pig iron, twice the amount of coal, and increasing oil production by 75%. The emphasis was on success. Failure to achieve the set quotas resulted in sensational trials with the defendants accused of sabotage, being foreign agents, or other crimes. In addition to controlling industries, Stalin also directed changes in agriculture. He forced farmers to combine their land into huge state farms known as Sofrose or Kolkhose. The peasants destroyed their crops and livestock rather than give it to the state. Stalin reacted by sending those who resisted to labor camps. What is Soviet Socialist Realism? 
At that time, the Communist Party decreed socialist realism as an official art style of the Soviet Union. Official Soviet art portrayed the everyday life of common people in order to inspire workers to labor harder for the success of communism and to advance the Soviet dream of creating a communist society. The dramatic use of color, light and vigorous brush strokes created an original style which, according to some specialists, was reminiscent to French Impressionism. What was the Great Purge? In 1934, Comrade Stalin began a vicious purge of real and suspected opponents in the Communist Party and the Red Army. He charged that hundreds of high-ranking party members and top army officials were plotting against the state. Millions were arrested and sent to labor camps, and many put to death. These events were known as the Great Purge. Stalin's purge took place in the 1930s, when the Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler was in power in Germany. In 1939, just a few days before the beginning of World War II, Stalin signed a treaty with Hitler in which they agreed for the two countries not to fight each other. What were the effects of World War II on the people of the Soviet Union? In spite of the treaty, in June of 1941, Germany turned on its former ally and invaded the Soviet Union. Only after this attack did Stalin join Great Britain and the United States as allies in World War II. In early 1942, the German army besieged Leningrad for 900 days. The city endured constant shelling, freezing cold and hunger before the Red Army broke through German lines in 1944. For the remainder of the year, the Soviet troops pushed westward across the Nazi-held countries of Eastern Europe. Germany surrendered on May 7, 1945. World War II had left Russia in ruins. The Russian dead from fighting, disease and hunger were said to number 25 million. One out of every 10 Russians had perished. More than 1,700 cities and 70,000 villages lay in ruins. What were the main characteristics of the Cold War? Even with the losses and destruction during World War II, the Soviet Union was still one of the great world powers. The United States was the other one. There was a great period of distrust between the Soviet Union and the United States that led to the Cold War a type of diplomatic war in which there is no shooting, only arguments and tension. The United States and Russia greatly feared each other after World War II. The United States believed the communists when they talked about dominating the world. 100 million East Europeans were united into the Soviet bloc. The United States and the Soviet Union had differing ideas on how to deal with the defeated Germany. The Soviet Union turned the eastern zone of Germany into a communist state called German Democratic Republic, with its capital in Berlin. In 1949, the United States lost a major military advantage when Russia exploded its own first atomic bomb. The United States then began building an even more powerful hydrogen bomb. The United States had its first H-bomb in 1952. The Russians exploded theirs in 1953. The threat of nuclear war kept tensions high between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. What was the historic role of Nikita Khrushchev? When Stalin died in 1953, comrade Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev became the leader of the Soviet Union. In his famous secret speech of 1956, 
to the 20th Communist Party Congress, Khrushchev openly accused Stalin of poor leadership and exposed him as a mass murderer. He emptied labor camps and brought more freedom and openness to the Soviet Union. Khrushchev made efforts to make life easier for many people. One reflection of this was a massive house building program. What were the major firsts in Russian space exploration? The Soviets had many firsts in the history of space exploration. The Soviet Union stunned the world in 1957 when it launched Sputnik, the first spacecraft to circle the Earth. It was a sign that the Soviets were ahead of the world in missile development. Khrushchev's plan to compete technologically with the United States seemed to be working. The launch of the first orbiting satellite led to the development of communications, weather, and other scientific satellites in both the Soviet Union and the United States. The Soviets also sent the first man into space, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin in Vostok 1 on April 12, 1961. He orbited the Earth for one hour and 48 minutes and became a world hero. The Soviets also performed the first spacewalk in March of 1965 when Alexei Leonov took a 10-minute walk in space. Later, the Russians made the first soft landing on the moon with an unmanned spacecraft. What was the Cuban Missile Crisis? For much of the post-war period, tensions remained high between the United States and the Soviet Union. The most serious post-war crisis arose in 1962, when the Soviet Union installed nuclear missile launching sites in communist Cuba. In response, the United States set up a naval blockade around Cuba to prevent the delivery of more missiles and missile parts. In a tense confrontation, President Kennedy demanded that the Soviets remove all missiles from Cuba. Tensions ran high. Would the Russian ships carrying missiles yield? The world waited and prayed. Khrushchev agreed to pull Russian missiles out of Cuba if the United States promised not to invade Cuba. Why is Khrushchev's leadership considered controversial? Although Khrushchev improved relations with Western nations and created better conditions for Russians, many of his domestic policies were not as successful. His farm program was a failure. In 1964, Khrushchev was thrown out of office and forced to retire from public life. Why is Brezhnev's leadership called the period of stagnation? Comrade Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev assumed leadership in 1964. He tried to ease the tension between the Soviet Union and Western countries. Trade between the East and the West increased. The United States and the Soviet Union also began talks to decrease the number of nuclear weapons on both sides. In 1972, they agreed to limit such weapons. The Brezhnev era was both politically and socially the most stable of all periods of Soviet history. For most Soviet citizens, the period from 1964 to 1982 was one of improving living standards, which also included free health care, education, and social security. However, a heavy price was paid for these achievements. The Brezhnev years saw a decline in the rate of Soviet economic growth. By the end of the 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s, Russia had reached the point of stagnation. What were the shortest periods of leadership during the Soviet era? Yuri Andropov provided leadership to the Soviet Union 
for 15 months from November 1982 until February 1984. As Andropov succumbed to his long illness, he had attempted, toward the end of his life, to pave the way for Mikhail Gorbachev to succeed him. Also suffering from declining health, Chernenko continued what Andropov began, modest policy changes. When he died in March 1985, it was the third death in Soviet leadership in three years. Leadership would now be passed to a new generation. When comrade Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev became the head of the Communist Party and the leader of the Soviet Union in 1985, there was unrest throughout the country. Gorbachev also recognized that many of the communist republics wanted complete freedom from the Soviet Union. He initiated changes and made two Russian words famous throughout the world. The words were perestroika and glasnost. Perestroika means restructuring. In simple terms, Gorbachev wanted to change the Soviet economy so that it could work more efficiently. He also called for greater political power for government bodies elected by the people. In March 1989, the Soviet Union held its first free but limited elections. Glasnost means openness. For most of its history, Russia had been a closed society. Its leaders didn't tell its people or the rest of the world what was going on. Gorbachev would now create a policy of dealing openly and honestly with everyone. Russians could now speak out against the government without fear of going to prison. In February of 1990, the Central Committee of the Communist Party voted to allow a multi-party system in the Soviet Union. Gorbachev will probably be remembered for introducing the idea that society should be ruled by law and not by the whim of a Communist Party leader. Caught between the conservatives of the Communist Party who wanted to preserve the Soviet Union under the old rules and the radicals who wanted total democracy, Gorbachev tried to please both sides. His failure to do so led to the assumption of power by Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin. In any event, Gorbachev will go down in history as a great man of the 20th century. I am Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin. My place in Russian history was secured in June 1991, when I became the first leader in Russia to be directly and democratically elected. How did I become the first president of Russia? I joined the Communist Party in the early 60s because it was the only way to success. I also held the position of Communist Party First Secretary for a Communist province. In April of 1985, a few weeks after Gorbachev's appointment as General Secretary of the Communist Party, I went to Moscow as supervisor of construction for the entire Soviet Union. A few months later, I became head of the Communist Party, which was considered top leadership. It was in this position that I developed the style that made me popular among the people. Within days of my appointment, I was touring downtown shops, waiting in line for buses and catching the metro. These were all unheard of for pampered communist officials. I made a speech in which I criticized special privileges for communist leaders. Communist officials did not want to lose their special privileges and would challenge those who attacked those privileges. I attacked the privileges and Gorbachev defended them. I won the support of the people for my stand and Gorbachev won the support of the Communist Party members. This was the beginning of a famous and fateful feud. I decided to resign as a candidate for the political bureau and I also quit as party chief of Moscow. 
These acts were unheard of in the political leadership of the Soviet Union. When I quit, the Communist Party viciously attacked me and said that I had disgraced myself. In 1989, when the Soviet Union held its first nationwide election since 1917, I won Moscow's at-large seat. In August of 1991, all activities of the Communist Party were suspended. More stunning events followed rapidly. Gorbachev resigned as General Secretary of the Communist Party. On December 25, 1991, Gorbachev announced his resignation from the presidency of the now non-existent Soviet Union and the white, blue and red flag of Tsarist Russia was raised over the Kremlin, replacing the famous hammer and sickle flag of the Soviet Union. I then moved into the role of the President of Russia. What characterized New Russia? With the collapse of the Soviet Union, the 15 former Union republics were now separate states, which were each faced with economic difficulties. Eleven of the 15 republics joined in a union called the Commonwealth of Independent States, or CIS. Politically, relations between all branches of government deteriorated. The political problems of power were more difficult to overcome than the opposition to my leadership. While I supported and put my weight behind price liberalization, privatization and movement to a market economy, economically it was virtually unavoidable that standards of living would get worse before they got better. 1992 saw a drop in average real incomes along with inflation and job insecurity. Rising prices and the shortage of food followed. Because of food shortages and lack of adequate housing, life is hard for the average Russian family. Change has come rapidly to Russia and the former Soviet Union. Western culture has made big impact in Russia, especially with the younger Russians. Rock music and jeans are popular and young people are learning Western ways from television. To predict Russia's future would be difficult. What will Russia become? A return to Russian aristocracy or Soviet-type socialism seems unlikely. Russia is changing every day, searching for her new place in the 21st century. Whatever the change, I hope that Russia will experience new freedoms, growth, cultural sensitivity, political stability, and global unity. This concludes our journey back in time and our special opportunity to explore the rich heritage of Russian history. I hope you were able to answer the questions presented at the beginning of our journey. Does history help to shape culture? Or does culture make history? I am sure that all of you would agree that history helps to shape the culture, and culture helps to define history. Let's say thank you and goodbye to our special friends who helped to make this exploration possible. Cyril from the Origins of Russia, Catherine the Great from Imperial Russia, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin from Soviet Russia, and Boris Yeltsin from Renaissance Russia. Finally, look at this picture. It is called Eternal Russia. It was created by the famous modern artist Ilya Glazunov in order to celebrate 1,000 years of the adoption of Christianity. A closer look at this picture allows you to see every era of Russian history. We see its famous governmental, literary, and artistic leaders all positioned behind the religious saints. This picture reminds us that Russia is a multifaceted culture steeped in rich history, religion, artistry, beauty and change.